Oh, there we go. Wonderful. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending the Talent Guard webinar entitled Seven Ways to Encourage the Adoption of Effective Talent Management Practices. I'm glad to have you back for those that are uh, repeat attendees, and welcome to those who are new to this webinar. We are going to get started. Okay, my name is Linda Janak, and I'm the President and CEO of Talent Guard. Um, I'm also the author of a book called Fake Perfection, which is uh, a book about uh, career transition and the, the pain people go through. Uh, when that happens and I'm also a certified professional in career management and my newest endeavor is um, I'm the business coach for America's Fittest CEO and it's a reality TV series that's going to be coming out in the next three months so that's an interesting show in and of itself and we're going to be talking about a company today uh, called Medco and if those who have been with me they understand who Medco is it's a uh, and I'm going to be sharing a little bit about Medco the actual case file is real, uh, but we're using a fictitious name. So I'd like you to meet Jerry. Jerry is the CEO of Medco. He's been with the company for about two years, and he was specifically hired by the board to expand international um, growth and to fuel revenue. So they're about a $5 billion company, and they want to be a $10 billion company in the next five years. So he has some aggressive goal growth goals to meet. Let's talk a little bit about Medco. The company is about 30 years old. They're a medical device company. And they primarily have grown through acquisition. And they've been doing acquisition since uh, early 1996. And I've kind of get, given you just a, a little highlight, if you look at the bottom of the screen, on the number of acquisitions that they've had across the years. And you can see here in 2012, they had a, a massive acquisition. It's you know almost a merger in a way because both organizations were very very large, and with um, with that they are experiencing some challenges. Uh, a couple of those difficult time recruiting top talent. They're having some talent retention problems. Uh, they want to grow globally. Um, they have a very competitive industry. Their business model has to change. They can no longer operate the way that they have based on some of those competitive changes as well as regulatory. Uh, they want to be the lead company in terms of product development, uh, yet they um, haven't really introduced new products except for the acquisition. And this acquisition is going to be a massive integration. And just so you know, they have about 15,000 total um, employees across the globe, and they have about 60 products. So a little bit about the acquisition. Um, as you know, being in HR, it's a very difficult um, and time-consuming process. So um, a lot of things are going on in this company at this time. Um, they're experiencing massive culture shock, uh, tons and tons of people trouble, uh, from screaming in the hallways to um, just outright leaving the organization, and integration issues across the board from figuring out how to merge data, how to merge customers, who plays in what territories, uh, lots, of, um, lots of things like that. So, and these are just the top ones. As you know, having gone through a uh, merger myself a couple of different times, um, it's, it, can, it can really take a company down. And that really is where Medco is at this point. So to overcome some of these obstacles, the CEO um, he's got to do something because it's his worst nightmare right now, and he's getting a lot of pressure from his board to fix it. So what Jerry decides to do is restructure the company. Uh, he met with his board, and they decided that restructuring of the company with the goal of improving the culture, unifying the team, refocusing on some very specific goals, and inspiring people again uh, because it is a very low morale place to work and um, you know he wanted to try to take these apples and oranges if you will and make them one rather than having these split divisions across the two folds. So they focused on four major changes that needed to occur and we're going to talk about those. So a couple of the areas that needed changing, um, after you know, they had done this massive analysis, I mean, a whole integration team came in, a consulting firm, really to figure out what were the best changes for the organization. And once they evaluated the markets, the customers, 
their business model, their policies, and their talent um, processes, they decided that based on that, they had to move from a regional focus to a strategic business unit product focus. And you can see from this chart, um, you know, basically this is how their chart ended up being, that they needed to do that because each of these, one of the things that was happening in the organization was a lot of politics, and the team felt that the SBUs needed to be given more autonomy to make uh, faster decisions, to be more agile, to improve performance, and also to tighten cost controls. So this model was more effective for their organization moving forward. In addition to that change, um, they wanted to really focus on value creation and talent development and found that their organization was too bloated, if you will. So um, there wasn't a lot of visibility from the CEO down to the team lead on what was really happening with talent uh, across the board. So they decided to reduce management from 10 to 4. And it didn't mean that, that everybody got fired. It meant that they just had a lot of shuffling internally within these specific business units. I think it was only like a 10 to 15 percent reduction when all was said and done. Um, so this, this new structure allowed them to eliminate a lot of redundancy and give a lot of autonomy to the people who are going to lead these efforts moving forward. And since the company had acquired um, this new firm, they had a lot of products that were very different from uh, Medco's product line, which introduced a whole set of challenges in terms of new capabilities. And with new capabilities, the organization found that it had a lot more skill gap, ability gaps, and they needed to fill the knowledge as well. So um, they, didn't, they didn't know if they had, within their current talent pool, the ability to fill some of those gaps. So they didn't know if they were going to have to promote from within, hire from outside, uh, but they knew they had to do something because they were seeing a lot of challenge, especially in the international ex ex um, expansion over policy and how those policy works differently from what they knew today was a big problem. And then the fourth area uh, really focused on how do we provide strategic leadership that is going to focus more on results and accountability. And what you can see across this line, really what we're demonstrating here is two people, Thomas and Joel, they are the people who had been with the company the longest. Kathleen, Michael, and David were brand spanking new, um, not even from the other company. These were just people that they had hired because they had retention. And they still had three critical roles that were going to be the strategic team that were still open. So lots of turnover at the highest levels, which you know, when that happens, that can be very detrimental to an organization and its strategy moving forward. So those were the four major areas that the executive team felt needed to happen with the restructuring. And what we're going to focus on today is the talent challenge, kind of that fourth area of the restructuring and all the things that they had to do in order to make their company operate on best practices. So let's look at the four overarching uh, problems that this organization was having and why the talent group or the talent function wasn't functioning so well. So what we saw was that there was no overarching talent management practice or philosophy. Each group um, was using their own, for example, competencies and performance reviews. There was no timeline and expectations around when reviews actually occurred. They had an eight-page performance review. Um, the usability uh, of the actual 360 was outrageous. Uh, you know, it had somewhere like 150 different competencies and indicators, which is way too much for a 360, so it's very unfocused. Um, ineffective process. Um, so there was no one standard overarching process about how performance reviews got, got done. It could be at the end of the year, the beginning of the year. There was no anniversary date. And, you know, these are things that just had got muddled over time after so many acquisitions and so many people turning over. Uh, no top-level support. Um, so, you know, there was no, no buy-in whatsoever from the CEO down on the importance of talent management. They could not identify talent because they had no visibility into their talent pool. And um, these four coming together caused caused the organization to not operate at the highest performing level. So what Jerry did was he decided that for, the, um, for this to be successful, 
they didn't have that overarching head of HR, so they, Jerry believed he needed an objective perspective, and he called in Linda Janak. And Linda's their talent management consultant, external, and uh, actually met Jerry at a CEO summit, so we had lots and lots of discussions about our business challenges. But what Jerry didn't realize was that Linda's really an HR hero in disguise, and um, my role in that was to lead the evaluation of the current TM processes and practices across the combined companies. And so Talent Guard went in there and helped, helped Sarah who you'll work with momentarily, another HR hero who's been with Medco, and you've, you've, many of you have met Sarah before, for several years, and she has taken on many, many HR initiatives at this company to help them tra transform their talent management practices. So this is going to be Sarah's biggest yet, um, biggest project in HR yet. So she's really excited about this opportunity. And together, during the evaluation, which took uh, approximately three months to, to get through um, our analysis and come up with some recommendations, we identified seven problem areas. And these areas include um, amb ambiguity, meaning there's no clear expectations around performance management 360 in succession, most specifically. Complexity, uh, as I mentioned before, they had an eight-page review and their 360 was completely unfocused. Now, fairness, and that may sound like a, weird, uh, a strange word to put up here as a, as a challenge, but everybody was created equal. Um, there was no division of high potentials and low potentials. You know, somebody could get an increase, a raise increase as a high performer, um, and that could be the same increase at the bottom of the organization because it was a very paternal type of environment. Detachment, um, there was no connections. What I mean about that is no connections across the business units or regions very subjective, so um, even though they didn't do a lot of talent planning, there was still talent mobility, and that talent mobility happened uh, via emotional managers, those who spoke up the loudest, those who had the loudest voice, those who had been in the company the longest and knew more talent than others, uh, purposeless. So there was no meaning in the work that was getting done. So the adoption rate on performance reviews, for example, they just didn't feel it was necessary, a lot of the employees. And inconsistent, meaning sometimes it got done and sometimes it didn't. And again, wasn't driven from the top. So what I'm going to do is go through each of these and share with you the actual problems that they had and how we went about putting new process or new um, infrastructure in place to change those while keeping it simple. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Medco. In this particular scenario, um, you know, we got to give them kudos for doing 360. So, you know, we don't, I don't want to ding anybody, but in doing so, um, when the business units got restructured, you know, one of this man, one manager in particular wanted to have access to um, his employees or those people that he was thinking about bringing on his team, their 360 and their performance reviews and uh, things of that nature. But what happened was he could not get access to those 360 reports. He got tons of resistance from HR and from the employee because when this program rolled out, employees were told that their information was confidential and that only they would have access to it and only if they wanted to share it would it be seen. Um, that's just not a good situation. So. The problem was that Medco did not set the right expectations about how information would and could be used and who could access it. It's causing lots of problems. That means that limits visibility into your talent. So upon in further investigation, what we did is a survey just to figure out who's participating in these 360s and, what, and, and what's going on. So we found out that only 40% of the you know, 3,500 or so executives were doing 360, and only a very small percentage of employees were engaging in those. Um, and then of that, some of those executives, very few were sharing the results with their CEO. And then we had an even smaller percentage of executives engaging in the formal performance management process, meaning they're actually doing the reviews and sharing that with their CEO and or they're engaging in reviews with some of their direct reports. And then we had a higher percentage of employees doing the performance management process, but the challenge was that 
In some groups, only the manager had input to the review. In other groups, employees did their own self-review and managers did the review. And very infrequently um, did we see actual signatures and sign-offs. So although it was being done, it was not being done well. So how did we change the rules? Well, as you know, being in HR, buy-in is absolutely critical. So what we did is we came up with some new policies around uh, talent management that would drive clarity among everybody in the organization. And it's easy to put these bullet points up on a piece of paper and have Jerry send them out to the whole organization, but it wasn't so easy creating them and getting buy-in. Jerry actually received tons and tons and tons of feedback from his direct reports about sharing of information. Uh, but Jerry held strong because he knew that if he was going to transform the company, he had to transform the culture. And to transform the culture, you have to transform your people, and you do that through policy. So uh, he, he held steadfast on these rules, um, and you can read through them. I'm just going to touch on them lightly, meaning all executives, including the CEO, are going to participate in the 360 in the performance management programs. The results of the CEO and executive team would be shared with the board and any employee who wishes to see it. So they wouldn't just distribute it out to everybody, but if someone wanted to see how the CEO got evaluated, they could. HR had to come up with all of the new definitions, like what is a top performer, what does it look like, versus a low performer, so that we could drive more informative decisions. They're going to communicate, they did communicate how HR decisions were based, and I'm going to share some of that with you today that leadership can see the results of the 360 in PM for their span of control. And the only time that changes is when the CEO has his um, biannual talent review. And during those meetings, they can see, all those executives can see across the organization one level down. Decisions about talent mobility would be made based on your 360 in PM. And that investment in employees were also, meaning the amount of money spent, per employee or per talent pool or per group was based on those results as well. So that was just the start. There were a lot more and these were a lot more descriptive, but just from a high level perspective, this is the one thing that, that we did to change how information was getting used. Now as part of that change effort, the specific things that we did to try to drive more best practices was develop criteria for key positions. So this organization had some very important roles that were very, very hard to fill. One, you know, one being a research scientist where you had to have an extraordinary amount of education uh, and experience in the field and losing just one of those roles uh, could be severely detrimental to the organization. Identifying the top 10 roles based on that criteria. Creating a high potential competency model to use as a framework for role-based competency models, and implementing formal succession planning for those key roles. And we're going to break those down for you. So when we're thinking about criteria, it's really important that we look across the organization and work with an HR task force, which we did, to put some level of descriptors around the things that were important specifically to this organization. And there's a good book out there, The Differentiated Workforce, which I think is an excellent framework for thinking about key position selection. And we, came, and we used and adopted their framework for uh, this organization because it was simple and it works. So basically, what our goal was was to identify the A positions, and those are most strategic to the organization, B meaning the support role, and C being surplus. So um, these were just a few, I think I have five here, five of the characteristics, we actually had 25 characteristics in total that range from scope of authority, um, effect on value. So, you know, the A positions are going to be the ones who can build wealth for an organization or significantly impact it. So we didn't want to think that all executives were in A positions because that was not the fact. An A position could stretch all the way down to an individual employee within the organization. So once you come up with your criteria, and this is very difficult to come up with. It, it, it probably took us several weeks to get the criteria on a piece of paper and then buy-in from the management team. So um, there's no right way to do it. Uh, it's really going to be based on your strategy, which in this case, uh, Medco's strategy was really about um, having the best product value, 
they wanted to have product variety, they, they wanted to win on professional expertise, and they wanted to be known for research and development. So what their strategic capabilities ended up being were wealth impact, competitive impact performance, and then all about saving lives, because that's what they do. So when we started thinking about both their um, position criteria and their strategic role, like how are they going to operate you know, in the actual market, we identified five areas, and those being research, product design, customer-facing sales marketing, and then just overall leadership as the key areas. And then within those, ranking our most, you know, our top, top position was chief scientist for that role, followed by technical director. So you can read it across the board, and we ranked them in that way of which roles are so important to the company that we need to keep people in those roles, and we have to have multiple successors for each of those roles. So as you can see, because research and development is important, the chief, and the chief scientist is very important. Once we had that, then we had to start thinking about how do we develop, because each one of those roles, the chief scientist, that became a talent pool. Um, and you can look at talent pools in a lot of different ways, but we decided to have 10 talent pools, and all of our development was going to focus on those 10 areas. So once we came up with our, what I'm just going to call our generic high potential competency model, and this model is based on our strategic uh, indicators that we just talked about before, we broke those competencies out into three key areas. Those that were foundational, meaning you have to master these before you can move on to your management competencies, and then we broke out management from leadership. And the theory being the, you know, forecast, growth, and returns, all of those are a lot harder to master than how do you connect with other people in your organization. So these are level of difficulty, that's how we're representing those, as well as some key areas, you know, management versus leadership, so that you have some indicator of why we have numbers and why they're stretched like that, and not just in one blanket piece of paper on um, with a list. So that's why we did that. And also, the reason why we did that is because we wanted to be able to have, some people call this the nine box, some people call it the talent grid. We wanted to be able to, again, bring clarity to what HR thought about its talent and how it communicated with its talent. So the blue, the upper right-hand corner, boxes one, two, and three, represented for us your, your high performers and your high potential. And then the bottom you know, seven, eight, and nine representing your lowest performing employees. Now, this is color coded and I'm going to talk about it in a minute, but these boxes also represent the competencies. So the theory being when we started was in, in this lower quadrant, people have to master the competencies in this box and you'll see those. And as you move up into the higher level, you're operating at a level that is strategic to Medco. So it was a kind of an innovative thing. Uh, we hadn't seen it done before, um, and it worked very effective. So what we did is we put definitions around what is a future leader, what does it actually mean, and you're only seeing bits of the information. Each of these boxes was probably paragraphs and paragraphs long. Um, but what does it mean in terms of uh, timing? So you're a future leader, a future leader in box one meant you're ready for advancement immediately. So anybody in this box, what that meant is you are ready for a move. So you could take on a new role, a new position. You are ready for the role that's been identified for you within that specific talent pool is, a, is an easy way to say it. And um, we're going to see lots of people in these boxes. So that's how you think about these boxes. Now, it's what I find a lot of people do is they only lead with this box, very, very simple. Well, if you're not defining specifically the definition of each box, then there is no way you're going to get agreement from your managers on where, where people fit. So the more detailed you get, still keeping it simple, the better, because then managers have a tool where they can say, does this person meet all of these factors, yes or no? Because we're going to drive some of that objectivity, which we'll talk about in a minute. So. What we did is we clarified it there. Then we also clarified, this might be a little bit hard to read, but where do those competencies set? So it is assumed 
that if you're in box one, that you've mastered in terms of a competency, the ability to lead change, you know, global communication, forecasting revenue, those sorts of things. So each time you move up, what this also represents is where is the company willing to make investments when you're at a certain point. So employees that are in box six, the organization said we are willing to make an investment in you as an employee if it's focused on one of these four areas. So again, instead of having a catalog of learning resources that maybe only 2% of those um, courses get used, we wanted to find a way to really focus those dollars spent because dollars were limited and where they got spent and tie it to the organizational objective of moving as many people as we can toward that one. So everybody in the company knew what was being invested in, what skills were important. They knew within the box, you've mastered every other box down below if you're in that existing box, and we could all talk about the same things at the same time with the same definitions, which eliminated a lot of ambiguity. And finally, thinking about the investment, we also said we want everybody to know how much of our employee development dollars are going to be spent within each of these quadrants, if you will, with, you know, 30% of our overall budget will be spent on employees who are in box one. We're not going to spend anything on anybody in box nine because they're not performing. But if we see potential, this is how our dollars got mixed. And then we measured that. That was one of our key performance indicators at the end. Were we making the right investments in the right skills with the right people within these ranges? Very, you know, if you track the data, it's very easy to answer. So next, let's talk, you know, that was ambiguity. Complexity was the second area where we found humongous challenges. And it was because the process was convoluted. So sometimes people did performance reviews. Sometimes some of the managers did 360. And even in the 360, as I mentioned, they had you know, over 20 competencies with 15 questions each. That's a really long 360. We usually recommend eight competencies with 10 questions each or five question, questions each and making it really focused on um, an objective, we, you know, asking the question. Most people do 360s just to do them to have that multi-rater feedback, but you want multi-rater feedback with a purpose. Their performance appraisal, and this is not including the development plan, was eight pages. Now, I don't know how many pages you have, but that is not an effective performance appraisal. And what happened was man, one manager wanted something, another manager wanted something, and a different manager wanted something else. So they just kludged it all together rather than figuring out how to define the appropriate performance appraisal for each group because they can be different. Um, you just have to have a way to manage that. And then development planning, very typical, done one time a year. You know, everybody focuses on getting those goals on a piece of paper, uh, but rarely are those goals tracked. So they, did had, they had no tie into any corporate planning whatsoever. So anytime HR is involved in anything now, it doesn't matter if somebody says they want something, we say, what is the goal of it? Simple questions, but they can really drive positive results. What is the goal of us taking on this initiative? What is the benefit? Who benefits? And how do we keep it simple? It has to be something that can be easily rolled out, doesn't take a lot of time, doesn't require a lot of effort, but we have a high, a high impact. Now let's spend a little time talking about fairness. So as I said, everyone's treated the same. It was a very paternal environment. You had a lot of employees who had been around for a long period of time. The management team wanted everybody to feel good, everybody to get along. But it's a great mission. And you know, who doesn't want everybody to feel good? But what happens is when you have that kind of a culture, um, it's really hard to rate people because everybody gets rated high, for example, and that was the case here when we looked at people's ratings, everybody was a top performer. So um, it wasn't effective and it really takes away from the credibility of your program. So if you, know, a top, if you have a top performer, which they did, and they were getting the same ratings and the same rewards as the low performers, it causes a lot of um, resentment and, you know, resentment turns to politics, politics turn to attrition and, and defocused. So 
they had to figure out a way to really measure and measure it well. And it's if you use 360 and a performance review in the right way, you have data, objective data, that can be used if managers are taught how to read a rating scale, for example. It, you'd be surprised. This, this company had a, I think it was a three-point rating scale, and we switched to a five-point rating scale because there just wasn't enough delineation between, you know, the top performer and low performer and really provided lots and lots of, not only lots of detail around what, what is a 1 and how does it differ from a 2 rating and how does it differ from a 3, but we provided lots of training to the managers using uh, web-based tools, and then we had a lot of scenario building, like which, how would you rate these so that managers could really understand how can we do this together collectively um, and all strive for the right things because, you know, managers don't like to give feedback. Um, it's a very difficult thing to do. So once we had that data, once we, we actually did a 360 um, and a performance review process with the entire company after all of this training, and now we're probably eight months into the process, we were then able to take our performance data, right, so that represents your, your high performance on the top, and our 360, which, which represented our potential data, look at both scores and truly and objectively start plotting people on our talent grid. And our goal was to plot the top 20% of the company. So this chart got really, really big. And actually we moved from, it was so big that we had to move from manual to an automated one, but we'll talk about that later. But we could put it up on a wall and have true informative decision making across the executive table about who truly deserved to be where because we measure it, as I said, based on their 360, based on their performance, based on the position criteria, and based on the definitions we had for each quadrant. So we had a lot of decision-making tools that we could use rather than just a lot of finger pointing of, you know, who had the loudest voice and, and who should go where. And the CEO was a culprit for that, saying, this employee should be here because I've known him forever. Um, and that's really what we had to eliminate. So we were able to do that as a best practice um, within this organization. And then what we did is as we evolved the process and decided what are going to be our top 10 learning and development tools, we actually tied the information to each of the boxes. So obviously the people at the top were going to get the sweetest things like coaching and incentives and training and executive exposure and one-on-one -on -one CEO time versus, um, you know, box number seven at the bottom, training with executive approval. So um, we don't want, we, you know, again, using those dollars, and we didn't have a lot of them, we want to make the right investment at the right time on the right things for the right people. And this communication enabled everybody to see who we were investing in. And again, everybody had access to these tools. So let's talk about detachment. Um, you know, we want to give them kudos for trying to have a performance process, but I think this is a very telling picture because as we started to look at Sarah and I um, across the org and really kind of breaking down the performance and taking it at the, at the very most granular level possible, this is a great visual because what we found, there was no worldwide consistency. Uh, we actually ended up with 16 different performance forums and about 40 different 360s. Um, no visibility into the workforce data, no HR center driving strategy. So when we started breaking it down, we, we found three different scenarios. A business unit was doing PM and 360 using the standard HR manual forms. So if HR said these are the forms that that group was using, whatever they were handed down, we found uh, you know, a whole bunch of people or managers not doing PM or 360 at all. And if they did, it was inconsistent. So they would do it one year and not the next because they were too busy. And they had their own forms. And then we found another group doing PM and 360 um, but each manager had a different form, and it was only focused on what I'm going to call the values and not necessarily the core responsibilities, actually job-specific stuff. So even though they were doing them, they still were not getting the right data out of the forms for it to be useful. 
So what we decided to do um, within that business unit structure was fix it first and foremost and have what we called the talent management program office. And in that program office sat a team um, who reported to the CEO, if you will, much like a, it could be a CHRO, but having the business HR business partner model. So we decided that each business unit needed its own business partner. And the way that the roles um, were divided was the CEO sets expectation, participates in the reviews, he makes development the heart of the organization, it's an absolute priority, and has the, the regular talent reviews, which happen twice a year. The program office set the TM strategy, sets all the process and policies, selects the company-wide tools, and manages all of the company-wide analytics and reporting, so the KPIs. And then through that, the business partners adapts all tools to meet the specific needs of each business unit, and there were a lot of variation in what each business unit needed. They configured and custom, customized all the different um, 360 programs and the performance reviews to meet their needs while still maintaining the integrity of the policies of the program office. And they managed all of the timing and the roll-up of the data that went into the program office so that we could communicate the analytics in dashboards. And then management, of course, teaching them how to better apply the performance management practice, monitoring feedback on a monthly basis, providing feedback on a quarterly basis, and managing development plans um, as their daily bread and butter and making it social and making it interactive. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that process unfolded in a minute. And this structure uh, ended up working really, really well because each of the business units felt that their needs were being met and the CEO was able to have really good data in HR so that they could drive the company forward. A lot of visibility into, for example, we were able to say across the entire company our biggest competency gap is in strategy. So we knew that as a company we could invest lots of dollars overall as an organization in how to be more strategic. And we were able to slice and dice that data with a click of a button to say, well what's the competency gap in the in the spine business unit, for example, or the heart business unit, or what are the competency gaps across marketing? So department, grade, um, organization, we could look at the data in a lot of different ways to really figure out how to become a better organization, going from good to great, if you will. So now let's talk about the last few. Subjectivity. Now you may see this a lot in your organization. I know I've seen this a lot across my career. Sometimes it feels like out of thin air, someone was promoted or someone was put in a coveted role and it's just a magic wand happened. Like why was that person selected over someone else when we everybody else thought this other person? Well, it was a lot of subjective input. So uh, a lot, mo I'd say 90% of the decisions that were made in this organization was because one person said, hey, this person needs to be here for these reasons, even if they were not a good fit culturally or from a, from a performance perspective. So a lot of emotion, um, we're talking about loud words being exchanged, I and mean, I witnessed one of these arguments. Um, so, you know, a lot of passion, but that passion wasn't being directed in the right way. So we had to stop this because it was really driving a big part of the low morale in the organization. So what we did is we had to figure out a way to go from subjective to objective, and this is actually the slide that we used when we did our town hall meeting to say what we really truly want and the, the, the way that we're going to look at um, talent management is we're going to have some drivers. Those drivers are going to be 360 feedback, the engagement survey that only occurred with, with management, our performance review and our development plan. All of that is going to drive toward the manager's input. With that manager's input, they're the modifiers of decisions. We need to balance that out with the executive team input, and sometimes you might call this your calibration meeting. Some people call it their talent review meeting. This is where all scores get put up on the table, and they are discussed so that we truly have that 360 round table. Sometimes managers don't necessarily see all the performance things that their employees do because they may not be in the same geographic location or division, things of that nature. So help balance that out which would be the fundamental output of the succession matrix, 
so that we could drive more predictive people de development. So basically what that means is informed decision making. So purposeless. Well, that's, that is a lot, a big, big part of what we see today is employees either don't want to do it or don't feel it's necessary to participate in our HR initiatives because they feel it's a waste of time. And it's really sad because we know that it's not a waste of time. It's been proven over numerous, numerous case studies and business studies by all the experts out there that performance management matters. But when you're doing a performance review once a year and it gets shelved, when you're taking a 360 and it gets put in a manila folder in your desk and development doesn't happen, it's demo it, it, dis it demotivates people. So we had to turn that entire process around and really truly communicate the value of performance management. And we started with the CEO because we knew that the only way that we were going to drive adoption with the employee and management population was to tie it to the business and we needed the CEO to reinforce that so we actually um, actually used this slide from Burson's which is an incredible uh, well now Deloitte Burson I think so we used this particular um, slide to help the CEO understand the ROI and the business case for wanting to make goals cascade throughout the entire organization and impact our performance review and goal planning over and over and over again. So uh, it took a while because that is a massive undertaking to try to have that level of alignment in your organization. It's actually easier for smaller companies because the line of sight is a lot shorter. But when you have, you know, a 15,000 person company with four business units and shared matrix organization, that can be very difficult. But he was willing to invest the time. We kept it really simple for the first year and now they've built on that that business value or that new talent management process so again HR people need to start at the top to get that CEO buy-in and I know that can be difficult so a lot of CEOs don't even though they should don't want to bother with it and the way that we aligned it was we said the 360 feedback in the engagement survey are going to measure how we achieve the goal so 360 was truly truly used for values and behavior and then engagement measured how the behavior get got exploited so for example one of the questions in the engagement survey um, how often did your manager meet with you to review your goals you know and it was a lot or little or none um, so we measured everything that was important in our 360 so those two went hand in hand and then we used the development plan and that was the kickstart of our TM process and the performance review to measure the extent of those goals achieved. And the business goal, the divisional goal, the team goal, and the individual goals, so that's just an example. You don't have to have that many. Um, but when we say goal, that's what we're talking about. So we had metrics. So we could say, did we achieve 30% of sales in the U.S. territory? Yes or no? If yes, well, how did we go about doing that? If no, why didn't we do it? And then how might we change things in the future to drive more business and people outcomes? So again, we kept it simple. But we knew exactly how the information was used to align the organization with the TM process. And we, were, we did that, obviously, um, not through a lot of paper, but through a solution that enabled us to automate it. And Talent Guard provided the solution, and they used five of the six modules and I think they're going to be adding on the fifth so the performance module to drive the corporate alignment from the from the goals down to the performance the 360 to drive the we first started with a culture assessment and then moved into the behavioral leadership driving the succession planning model so those three very 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 useful together and then we added on the career pathing module so people could see how they could move across the organization based on their talent profile and based on the role profile and then learn track is your certification tracker and as a medical device company there were lots of certifications um, so that helped them tremendously and they started with one module and added on they didn't add it all at once and it took about a year to go through that process so inconsistent the last one um, this, I think, is a big one. It's very easy, especially when you have turnover, to forget what your predecessors have done before 
but we wanted to move from, this was their current process, they set and shared goals in the beginning, all your work got done, and then at the end of the year, it's really what this is showing, is very static, reviews got done and they got put in a drawer. So it was not an interactive cycle. So the new process, one that we called the culture of development, development planning became the heart and soul of the talent management process. Um, we really started the year off with that, the development plan. So how do we want to develop? And then that development plan was interacted on all year long by the manager and by other people that you invited into that goal management process um, to drive toward, and what we introduced later, you know, our journaling, our management feedback, our interim review. Then we did our 360, kind of mid-year, and then we finished it off at the end of the year. And we, and we did it on an annual cycle. We didn't have an anniversary cycle, but it could work very similarly, where the, we then used all of that feedback. And each time, the data and the goals were being refined because we had visibility into the dashboard. So managers were talking more. Employees were engaging more. Other people could comment on the goals. We were driving a lot of interaction across the company. And that resulted in company, this company going from having, you know, a lot of ambiguity to clarity, from complex to simple, from having too much equality to differentiation, from being disconnected to having a very disciplined process, from being subjective to objective, having meaning in the work that was being done in talent management, and being very consistent with the process. Um, and that whole process probably took about a year for us to implement overall. What resulted from that, managers received an overall 85% approval rating on their engagement scores, which is fantastic. 96% of the company completed their review and development plan weekly with weekly monitoring. So again, that came out of the engagement study. And then overall people effectiveness increased by 24%. So companies on track to achieve its goals, and when they're not on track, it was visible to see. And that concludes the talking portion of this presentation. Just a couple of notes before I take your questions, and you can send them to me via chat. On March 12th, we have a demo coming up. It's just a, a, an open demo for on our 360 product. And it's at 12 Central Time, and there's the link there. On March 27th, we have six succession strategies to develop middle managers into global leaders. So it's kind of, it's the next webisode that falls after this. It continues the story, and if anybody would like to see any part of uh, any of our modules, you know, please feel free to just send us an email, and we can set one-on-one uh, -on -one up with you. So at the conclusion of that, I'm going to move over here to the screen and see if we have any questions. Oh, and I usually get this question. This presentation, uh, within about two hours after this, we, we archive it, and then we provide um, information for you. Uh, on the website so that you can go and you can download it. Okay, so let me just let, look over here. It takes me a minute to open up the window. Okay, so one question sounds like a colossal and worthwhile effort. What did it cost? I think the overall consulting side of it uh, was probably, I'd have to go back and look. It was somewhere around fifty to sixty thousand, so not not too bad. And then the software, God, we're I think we're when they first started with performance, I think it was it ended up being a cost of about thirty six dollars per employee per year um, for a couple of the modules and then we added on after that. So uh, very affordable in my opinion for such a massive turnaround. So how was this process communicated to all employees? Roger wanted to know. Roger, great question. We primarily, you, we did a couple of things, actually. We did videos with the CEO, and those videos were posted on the intranet, and emails were sent out when it was those really important messages. So what I say is all the tough messages were communicated by the CEO, something that was a policy change, uh, negative, Anything that was very happy and had a, had a good style of communication was communicated through the head of HR, or Sarah in this case, because they were trying to find their HR replacement. And we used tons and tons of uh, email communication. We put posters up 
um, all over the, the, the major conference rooms with these, these charts. We had um, an HR splash. We did it. We had an HR fair. We used town hall meetings. I mean, it was, uh, it was like managing an entire marketing communication campaign. So it worked out really, really well. We probably, I think we ended up with something like 112 different communication um, products, if you will, from emails to posters that we put together um, with their marketing team uh, that really helped us, you know, build, build buy-in, essentially, is what we were doing. Okay, so how did you address the cultural shift with employees on their emotions and relationship to make TM decisions more factual based and robust? Excellent question, and I think it's Ayana. We use a 360 to do that. What we found is there was no way that we were going to be able to go to someone and say, all of, your all of your decisions are emotional and subjective. What we did is we, as part of our first kind of culture transformation 360, we put those questions in there so that the manager could then see objectively how people thought about, um, how people thought about their decision-making style and we use that as, an, as one of the levers to bring managers together and say, this is what's going on. Across, and it was across the board. So nobody really felt, it wasn't isolated to one specific person. It was just the way it was. But we were able to use that data to say, look, this is a problem across the board. Here's how it's impacting revenue. Here's how it's impacting our overall culture. Here's how it needs to change. Here's how we're going to change it. And change will be painful. But... And we did it in a very coaching style, right? So we had some coaches come in at the very top level to help with some of that transformation that could then get cascaded down. So uh, as much as possible, we tried to use, use tools that wouldn't make it personal, that made it more um, well-balanced, if you will. I hope that answers your question. How did you establish buy-in? Um, that's another question. Or overcome resistance? We did it through communication. So as I just said, we told people what the problems were. And people, if you, and if you do any kind of assessments, and if you've done this, you see it. Employees will tell you what's wrong. They will tell you what the problem is. But where we, where we fall down in any engagement I've ever been in is we need to say back to those employees, Here's, we heard you, here's where we agree we're falling down, here's what we're going to do about it, here's the timing for what we're going to do about it, we're going to do something about it, and then we're going to tell you what we did. It is managing a talent management effort as you would manage the release of a product, as you would manage the release of a marketing campaign. It must be managed in that fashion, and all too often, we take it piecemeal. We do one thing, and we do another thing, and then we do another thing, and, uh, and suddenly we don't know where we are in our own process. We have to be able to see where we're at at any given time and know what the next steps are so that we know where we've been and where we're going. And that information, that knowledge, must be um, available and transferred down and transferred over to other people so that we can all learn and keep track of where we're going because there's nothing worse than having someone leave an organization and everything was in their head. So um, I always try to be the sponge to pull out people's greatest assets, their knowledge, put it on paper and make it what I call an, a SOP, a standard operating procedure. Okay, can you elaborate on how the metrics used to calculate the overall people effectiveness at 24%? So one of the KPIs um, that we measured was the achievement of of goals. So, you know, what we saw was, and any, and you know, nobody's going to achieve their goals 100% of the time. So what we tried to measure in the beginning, when we started tracking the goals, we started tracking goals quarterly. So we tried to measure what was the increase in goal attainment from one quarter to the next. And then, then we moved it to the year because we had to teach people actually how to manage goals. They really didn't know how to do that in an effective way and teach managers to give input because it was math driven. So for example, with our tool, you can set a goal and you can say the goal is 10% achieved and then your manager can just agree or disagree and change that setting. So once we pulled a report on the whole organization on show us goal attainment at the end of the quarter and it would say something like, you know, of the 400 goals, we have about a 78% attainment rate. 
Well, if we measured it the next time, it was 24% better. So that, again, driving the numbers and being able to pull that level of data helped us drive the effectiveness of each person, which helped drive the overall effectiveness of the organization. I hope that wasn't too complicated because um, it was really an easy process to calculate because the system did it for you or for them. Any other questions? I'm happy to answer. Stay on the line. No? Well, excellent. I want to thank everyone for um, showing up on this webinar and um, taking the time to learn more about what we have to share with you. And we will be posting this shortly to our website and you'll get an email letting you know that it's downloaded just in case you want to go back and review some points and as always you know that you can email me uh, with your questions lynda.janak at talentguard.com and I also encourage you to um, you know go and link link in with me and um, you know become my friend so I hope to hear from you soon and I I really hope you have a wonderful day and I, I hope you enjoyed the presentation Thank you so much.